Hello everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another falconry video. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about laughing falcons, of all things. Uh, and uh, it's going to be enjoy it. And some of my thoughts on them and learning a little bit about them. And why on earth I would have them in a falconry video when they're not a traditionally used species. But before I jump into this species, if you haven't already, if you could hit subscribe to my channel, I very much appreciate it. And it helps me keep this channel up and going. So falconry, first let's back up a little bit. I do that all the time. I'd like to kind of give a framework for what I'm talking about. Falconry, so far as we know, came about as a way for people around the world to get food in the days before grocery stores and uh, even before bows and arrows. It was a way to train a bird to catch food and then once it's caught that food, maybe you get more, maybe you go out several more times. They eat some of it, you and your family eat the rest. So that's where it came about. This um, principle especially in areas where falconry has a very long history of hundreds or even thousands of years, has led to very specific species being flown. There are some species that live right alongside those that nobody even thinks about flying because maybe maybe their size or their choice of prey or whatever uh, leads be led in the past people to not think about using them in falconry. For that matter, a lot of what we today call micro falconry, using very small birds such as kestrels or a prime example, uh, merlin falcons, even though they do have a history in falconry, a lot of these smaller birds were not used or were not used until more recent times, the past few hundred years or even the past 50 years, because back in the old days, keeping a bird like that, training it to hunt, it's not bringing in enough food to make it worth the effort. But now we're in a very different world. We're, for the most part, in a digital age. And humans can take a look at falconry from very different perspectives from, uh, and, and, and why we do falconry. Most people in the world who practice falconry do not need to practice falconry in order to have food on the table. They can get it much easier other ways. So their motivations for practicing the sport are different. With that in mind, I want to talk about a species that I would kill to fly. I would do anything to work with this bird for falconry, for education, or even just to have the chance to observe them at length in the wild. It's a species I'm very passionate about, and that is the laughing falcon. Now, the laughing falcon gets its name because it makes a call that sounds quite a bit like laughter. Uh, sometimes it's just more of a vocal call, and sometimes it really does sound like they're up there mocking you. Being excessively vocal is not something most raptors do. Most raptors that are vocal do so in conjunction with defending a territory or during mating season, calling to a mate, something like that. Usually you don't, especially if you're not the biggest raptor around, you don't want to blah, just be making sounds all the time. This bird has no problem with that. They just, at dawn, all throughout the day, they just blah, 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 blah. They love to make a lot of sound. And they're very conspicuous. This is a New World bird. They live in Mexico, Central America, and the northern half of South America. And in their range, they are snake hunters, expert snake hunters. They will hunt other things, but they are snake hunters. But beyond that, they're not just, oh, I'm roaming the rainforest looking for a snake to kill. No, no, no. They're really smart. They have figured out that humans, human habitation, does two things. So, uh, first of all, human habitation invites rodents, which invites snakes. And second of all, human habitation in tropical regions results in cutting down trees to build houses, to build giant temples. You know, think of the Maya, the Aztecs, the, the Olmecs, some of these ancient cultures would build these big, huge structures, and they had big, open, clear-cut plazas and fields with crops. All of these things make it conducive to having more rodents in a condensed area, which makes it easier to hunt, but also makes it easier to see them. If you're in the rainforest pinpointing a snake, it's not that easy. But doing it where you're like, hey, I'm just sitting up on top of this giant step pyramid temple looking around and uh, oh, look way far away. I can see on the other end of this open plaza, there's a snake and I can go after it. It's pretty interesting. So over time, the laughing falcon has developed a relationship with humans. It likes to be near humans. It likes to be close to where, not that it enjoys humans themselves, but the, the way that humans alter the land and the way that those alterations impact other species invites just naturally laughing falcons to be near humans, both in the ancient world and in modern times. Now, in particular, 
We know from Mayan writings and Mayan scriptures, like the Popol Vuh, uh, the Mayan scriptures called the Popol Vuh, we know very specifically that in the ancient world, laughing falcons loved to hang out, especially by the ball courts where the sacred ball game was played. And we know that they would often hang out there and just be looking and people making all that commotion were more likely to disrupt or disturb any snakes. So they were vocal and they were visible. And because of that, they figured very prominently in ancient Mesoamerican lore to the point where in ancient Mayan, the laughing falcon was called Voc, V-O-C. And Voc kind of served a similar role to uh, the gods of creation, to the the the, the lords of of good, if you will, uh, yeah, without going into too much detail, uh, as messengers. Vok was a messenger. Vok was a herald. Vok was a symbol, kind of like um, there was a golden eagle in ancient Greece that was at the side of Zeus, and it's like, okay, you're my number one, and you're kind of a symbol of my power, and you're also my messenger. You'll inflict my justice. Uh, same kind of thing that Valk, the Laughing Falcon, in ancient Mesoamerican lore, figured very prominently, which is one of the other reasons why I love this bird so much. Now, as a snake hunter, it's got a few interesting things. The scales on the legs are thicker, and you'll notice that its beak looks small. It doesn't have a small beak. It has giant head feathers. Not only this way, but it will poof them up. And this is a very good thing, a lot of birds, when they do hunt snakes, will poof up in various ways to provide a more false target or bigger uh, to, to, do, to get the attention of the bird. So if you have, like for example, all the old world snake eagles, many of them will have big poofy heads too, or even a crest on top. So they come down, they land, and they're, they're going at the snake and they poof up, and the snake's like, oh, looking at the head of the bird, and then bam, they use their feet, which are being ignored by the snake. Laughing Falcon has a similar thing where it will poof out its head and make it look giant and the and the and the snake's like whoa whoa what is that and then the uh, Laughing Falcon will use its feet. Now that is an interesting way of hunting. They will go after non-venomous as well as venomous snakes. They do not care and because of that within a, the ancient uh, stories throughout Mesoamerica throughout the New World Throughout Latin America, you have many stories, including in the Mayan scriptures, that the laughing falcon is a bird that is a healer, that it can it, it has it has medicine or spiritual power that can be used to heal a venomous bite from any venomous creature, from a venomous snake to a scorpion to a spider. And so associating with it or ceremonial fans made from its feathers could be used for a blessing on you. Uh, and even the original story says that those two smudges uh, the, the two dark bands that go across his face that have to do with the story of how he originally got his magic and got his medicine. It's a long story, but it's, it's a fascinating one. So there's a deep, deep, ancient history of this bird uh, having reverence. And it's kind of sad we don't hear more about it, which is part of why I'm making this video. You, if you watch my channel, you know I go on and on and on and on about the ancient Egyptian link to the Lanner Falcon. The Lanner Falcon is, of course, the, the model, the personification of the Egyptian god Horus, which if you're a stickler for history, uh, the Greeks made it Horus. The Egyptians pronounced it Hor, H-O-R. You probably don't care, but there you go. So Hor or Horus was a Lanner Falcon. Everybody and their dog knows that. But few people have heard of a Laughing Falcon, and even fewer people have heard that this very strange and unique bird uh, had such an important history within ancient stories and ancient spiritual practices. And to me, that just makes it absolutely fascinating. But the bird itself, the bird itself is a weirdo. Uh, um, it comes, it is in its own genus. It is, it is a falcon, it is related to falcons, and the weird forest falcons, and Caracaras. It's related to all of those, but it is in its own genus because it's just kind of, it's this weird offshoot doing its own thing. But if you know falcons, when you say the word falcon, or if we're describing falcons, or if you're a new falconer and you're taking your falconry test, like in the United States where you have to take a, an exam to show that you know the basics, falcons are described as uh, having very long, narrow, pointed wings long narrow pointed wings and that they're bird hunters that they uh need open country vast open country and they circle up and they dive and they have momentum and they'll catch birds out of the air that is what most falcons do this falcon 
has been living in the forest for so long that uh, that it's the, the conditions have favored it to have a form, a shape, far more like an occipiter. The occipiters are the true hawks, like a northern goshawk, for example. Uh, occipiters have short, rounded wings and a very long tail and very long legs. And that is what this bird has looked like. The laughing falcon in flight, it looks absolutely nothing like a falcon. It's got wings like a goshawk. It's got a tail like a goshawk. It is built entirely different. Now, it is agile. It can fly very fast. But its primary way of hunting is just to sit around and wait to, to find a very prominent perch where it knows from experience, previous experience, hey, I know where I can find some snakes to hunt and eat. This is not a typical falconry bird. But that does not mean that it couldn't be a good falconry bird. But that's not even why I want to fly one. Before I get to why, let me just say, the American kestrel in the wild is mostly hunting grasshoppers and dragonflies and mice and voles. The occasional bird. But you're like, here's a tiny falcon and it hunts mice. Why on earth would you ever get a chance? And now it's one of the most popular falconry birds in the United States. They're great, and they're wonderful falconry birds. They've proven themselves. So just because a bird is doing something in the wild doesn't mean it can't uh, have other applications in sport of falconry. Uh, you can watch my video on harriers. I did a video on harriers, and I've hunted with them before. And, of course, New Zealand has perfected the art of effectively hunting with harriers. But if you looked at how they hunt in the wild, you'd be dismissive. I'm like, now nah, there's no way. So it is true that I would kill for the opportunity to fly a laughing falcon. I would do anything to just to be able to fly one and see what are they really capable of. Can they do pursuit flight on birds? Can they do pursuit flight on mammals? What if they were great on cottontail rabbits? I don't know. It, it's possible. But the real reason why I want to fly one or have the chance to just even work with one or if somebody had one to have the chance to, you know, kind of learn uh, even with education is I want to understand how they think. And let me explain what I mean. One of the biggest joys to me in falconry is understanding the thinking and the, the processing behind a species I have not worked with before. Every, every bird is an individual and every species is different from every other species. And it's always interesting to see why do certain birds behave certain ways? Why are certain birds um, more aloof about wearing a hood? Why are certain birds just happy as can be around commotion and other birds are like, no, you got to hunt with fewer people in the field? Why are certain pe birds really excited to hunt again and again and again and other birds, other species are like, no, I want to hunt one thing that day, be successful and call it good. I love to see how they react, how they respond and to say, okay, we've taken a falcon, open country bird hunter and made it a rainforest bird with goshawk proportions and it's hunting snakes near people I, I don't think people understand like a lot of rainforest birds are very aloof cautious they try to be away from people uh much is said here in the united states people are always going on and on about how peregrine falcons love to nest in cities big cities they're cliff nesters and so to them a skyscraper is a cliff cities are filled with pigeons prairie falcons don't do that Prairie falcons and peregrine falcons are incredibly closely related, but prairie falcons don't do it. Why? I don't know, but I'm fascinated by that. So why is it that the laughing falcon is very good being around people and just making tons of vocal noise? What would it be like to actually work with a bird like that? So that is one of the main reasons why I hope to someday be able to have some experience with the laughing falcon. I think they're amazing for all the reasons I've listed, but also I just want to understand their mind, their thinking, the way they experience this world. And that's one of the beautiful things that falconry allows. You don't fully get that opportunity with a lot of other forms of working with raptors, and falconry gives you that more in-depth chance if you do it right. So uh, kind of an odd video, but I hope you enjoyed it. I hope uh, you'll do a little more research yourself on laughing falcons. If you have had any experience at all with laughing falcons, whether seeing them in the wild, training them, or anything in between, please let us all know. Let us all benefit from your experiences. We would love to know more about these birds and uh, and what they're really like. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and let me know what other videos you'd like me to make in the coming weeks and months. And as always, happy hawking. <laughs>